Hello my dears, my name is Mariana and welcome to my channel. So people ask me a lot of questions about the tarot. I'm a professional reader and I get a little bombarded by questions about how to interpret certain cards, how to interpret them reverse, how to interpret them in certain contexts. So what I actually would like to do today is something I haven't really done before on this channel, which is very interesting to me, but here we go. Made a lot of videos about what to do and what not to do and how to find the right reader and all of those things, but I haven't really talked about how to read the cards. Now, my style of reading the tarot is a little unique. I do what I call archetypal tarot, and essentially what that means is that I fold in principles from depth psychology, specifically Jungian psychology, as well as a touch of mysticism, a touch of mythology, and I really create this system that is investigating what the cards are representing in our inner psyche. And I teach all of this in a program I call the Archetypal Tarot School. It's a nine week program that is very in depth, very immersive, and I teach it a couple times a year. The next one will open early 2023. So if you're a little interested, make sure you get on the wait list. There's a link in the description. But I thought what would be really great to share with you today is one of the principles from the Archetypal Tarot School that I teach my students. Because the minor arcana are actually a lot more difficult to read than we admit. We pull the Six of Swords in a reading and we have some keywords and we kind of understand what it's saying, but then when we try to apply it or we try to find out what to do with it, that's where we get stuck. So there's many ways to read the Minor Arcana. I have a lot of different techniques for reading them, but one of the key ones that's really useful in my reading for clients is using the Jungian cognitive functions. So essentially I'm connecting Jungian typology with the suits to really deeply understand what is going on with that card, how it's reflecting the psyche, um, and what we can do with it. What's the inner work that has to be done? So if this is interesting to you, stick around, we'll get into it, we'll explore some stuff. And if you like the style of video, if you're intrigued on learning tarot in this way and you want more videos like this, let me know in the, in the uh, comments. That would be really useful. All right, let's get into it. So let's start with when the world are Jungian cognitive functions. I promise it's not as brainy as it sounds, though it sounds pretty snobby and ridiculous. So if you have been on this channel for a while or you know anything about Jung, you know that he thought a lot about how to break down the pieces of the personality. And one of his main contributions, actually one of the things he's most known for, is the cognitive functions, the four types. And there's a really high chance you've taken the MBTI test or the Myers-Briggs test. And if you have, yes, I already know you're an INFJ. We all are. No, but seriously, this has actually been something that's been on my mind a lot lately because I put out a video a while ago um, where I basically said, I know you're an INFJ. And there was a whole bunch of people who reached out to me that were like, how did you know? And it doesn't make any sense because these tests will always tell you that INFJ is the rarest of the types, and yet everybody I meet who has taken the test has gotten INFJ. Sometimes there's a variation with INFP, but how can we all be the rarest of the types? And this is this is my this is my theory. Okay, let, all right. I think that we're all INFJs because all the people who click on videos, like the one that you just clicked on. Um, are a very specific type of person. They're somebody who's usually pretty intuitive. They're open to magic. They're open to the mysterious. They're people who are usually pretty in tune with their feeling center. They want to use tarot to do that work of self-discovery. They're people who are usually a little bit distant from that thinking function that's always kind of yelling at them about what is logical, what is objective. And I don't know, just saying, it kind of makes sense that we'd all be INFJs because here we all are. We all like the same things basically, so we all just kind of congregate in the same spaces. And so that's my theory. Anyway, <laughs> let's get back on topic. So what are these cognitive functions? What are the things that make up that MBTI or Myers-Briggs typology tests? Now the Myers-Briggs test, the MBTI, is not identical to Jungian types. There are a lot of differences between them and we are focusing specifically on the Jungian typological system. 
basically Jung theorized that there are four main types, four main um, orientations in the psyche that make up a personality. And we kind of have a hierarchy of them. These types are thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuiting. And everybody has all of these functions within them. The thing is that some are superior and some are inferior. And depending which of those is on top and which of those is on bottom, how they fall in the hierarchy of our personality, that makes up who we are. And so I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of these four types. They're a little bit hard to understand. It took me a lot of reading, a lot of kind of help to really lock them into my own brain. So I am going to try to say them in the simplest way I can, which may mean I reduce them down a little bit and kind of, you know, smooth over some of those complexities. So if you're a real Jungian person, don't come at me. <laughs> I'm trying. It's really hard to make it digestible in 12 minutes, so let's try. So basically there are two pairs of functions. There are the rational functions and the irrational functions. The rational functions are thinking and feeling, while the irrational functions are sensing and intuiting. So let's start with the rational functions. The thinking function is primarily about intellectual judgment and logical inferences. It's really about discerning what is true and false, what is right and wrong. I don't at all mean to say that the thinking function doesn't have any subjective material. You can have two thinking types in a room and they disagree about everything because the sense of intellectual judgment that comes through with the thinking function is often based on our actual subjective interpretation of data, of material. But we take that information and we create this, a lot of times like a binary kind of thinking with it. There's not a lot of room for gray <laughs> with a thinking type. So let's talk a little bit about the feeling type, which is the other rational function. You probably think, how can feeling be rational? Feeling is irrational, it's crazy, it's overwhelming. And I wanna make a really important distinction here between feeling and emotion. In the language of Jungian thinking, feeling and emotion are very different things. When we're talking about emotions, we're really talking about what Jung would describe as affects. Affects are intense emotional responses that can be triggered really by any of our functions. So just think of the last time you had an argument with somebody who was hyper-rational, a very clear thinking type, they probably got pretty angry. They were probably pissed off because their judgments of what is right and wrong was not clearly being accepted by you. And so that anger, that annoyance was an affect. It's an emotion, but it's this response. So when we're talking about the feeling function, we're not talking about anger necessarily or sadness or joy even. We're talking about our sense of value. We're talking about how things feel to us. And Jung described the feeling function being more about our, our moods, our kind of feeling states. And so a feeling type is rational because they are making judgments, they're interpreting things based on their subjective evaluation of it. So what they're discerning is not what is right and wrong, true and false. It's what is pleasant or unpleasant, what is good and bad. So to give you an example of what a feeling type is like, coming from a feeling type, when I am given an opportunity, a lot of times the choice I'll make or the judgments I make about it are really not about what's rational. Um, it's not about like, how much money would I make from this opportunity or how would this kind of take up my time? It's far more invested in what is pleasant and unpleasant about it. Would this make me feel good and happy or would this make me feel stressed and overwhelmed? I know myself intimately, I know my subjective experience, and so I'm trying to place my own inner values on the scales to really discern what's right and wrong for me. So the next time you're in a fight with a thinking type who says, you're being irrational, you can say, no, I'm not because Jung said so. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about the two irrational functions and let's start with sensation. Now, when we call them irrational, it is not to mean that they are lacking in rationality, it's more so to say that they're just really not about being rational. They're kind of beyond the rational, irrational binary. These are not so much about making judgments as they are about perceiving, about taking in information, taking in the world and responding to it. So the sensation function is really about perceiving things as they are. 
It's a bit more concrete. It's a bit more engaged with the senses, with the physical experience. Just as the thinking function was about what is true and false, and the feeling function is about what is good and bad, the sensation function is about what is and what isn't. The dress is either blue and black, or it's white and gold. In my experience, sensation types often tend to be artists. They tend to like to work with their hands. They tend to be really engaged in the stuff around them. I don't remember exactly where, but I remember hearing somewhere that in a history class, a sensation type would be much more interested in the tactics, how wars happened, how plagues were cured, etc., etc. While the intuition type, which we're going to move on to now, would be far more interested in why it happened, what happened after, what was the mystery underneath it all. So what the intuition type is ultimately about is discovering inherent potentiality. It's about investigating the greater meaning of something. So adding onto our formula of something being true, false, good, bad, is, isn't, the intuition function just asks why. And this is by far the most strange and hard to understand of all the functions. So don't worry if you don't get it. it took me a long time. But basically the intuitive types tend to have bursts of energy. They tend to have sudden like inspiration that comes over them. Ideas are always flowing. I saw a really good example of an intuitive type in that show um, We Crashed about the fall of WeWork. In that show, the CEO of WeWork, I think it's Adam Newman, um, is absolutely always just filled with ideas. There's always something going on in his head. He wants to try new things all the time. He has these great visions of possibility. And of course, because he's such an intuitive type and he sees the why all the time, the sensation function, the how and the what and the, the stuff of the actual business is kind of forgotten. And that's another thing we can layer onto our understanding of Jungian typology. When one of our functions is superior, usually it's paired opposite is inferior. So as a feeling type, my superior function is feeling and my inferior function is thinking. Which means that, as I said, when I have an opportunity come my way, I am very fixated on, will this make me feel good or bad? And I forget all about, is this right or wrong? So I want to offer this quote by Frith Luton, who is a Jungian scholar, um, and she has a really great blog that I highly recommend you check out. There'll be a link in the description. And she writes, briefly, the sensation function establishes that something exists. Thinking tells us what it means. Feeling tells us what it's worth to us. And through intuition, we have a sense of what can be done with it, the possibilities. So as I said, we all hold all four functions, but our psyches are always in motion. Some of these functions will rise and be more prominent and some of them will fall. Even if we're a natural feeling type, we may suppress that feeling because the world outside of us is expecting this thinking mode. Or if we're a natural sensation type, maybe that slowness of that sensing function is being hyper-stimulated and we're moving more towards the inferior, towards that intuitive side. We're always moving between these functions and that's where the tarot can come in and be so useful. So now if you know anything about the tarot already, if you're kind of familiar with it, you're familiar with the minor arcana, you've probably already been piecing together the associations that I'm about to talk about now. In the tarot, we have four suits of the minor arcana. We have cups, wands, pentacles, and swords. And each of these suits really neatly corresponds to one of these Jungian functions. The thinking function connects to swords. The feeling function connects to cups. The sensation function connects to the pentacles. And the intuition function connects to the wands. And so when I'm reading for a client and I see all wands cards on the table, I'm gonna know that this is really about those intuitive impulses. They're really questioning the greater why, the deeper meaning of things. Or if I see swords and pentacles and then there's no cups at all, I'm gonna question how that feeling function is being repressed or suppressed. Reading the suits in this way can really give us a deeper understanding of what's going on in our psyche. And now this is not at all to say that when we're doing a reading and we pull all swords cards, it means we're a thinking type. It doesn't work that way. As I said, we're always in flow. There's always an exchange. So the cards are showing us our psyche, our experience at that moment. 
I am personally a feeling type, as I mentioned. So when I pull cards, I often get a lot of swords. They're pointing to the fact that my thinking function is still suppressed. It's still inferior. So my task in that moment is to pull that up and to get some clarity about it, to really say, wait a second, do I need to bring in this sense of judgment? Do I actually need to be a little bit more objective about the situation? Oftentimes for people who are reading about career, I'll see lots of wands and pentacles, and a lot of times they're at odds because our sensation and intuition functions are so necessary for understanding what we need to do with our greater purpose, with our life's work. We get really fixated on the pentacle side, on the sensation function, fixated on what am I doing? How am I doing it? When does it need to be done by? And we forget the wands. Why am I doing it? What's the meaning here? What's the purpose in it? Or I get the opposite, honestly, which is even more interesting where it's all wands and it's all big ideas and there's not a pentacle on the table and there's nothing happening. That's just a little tarot professional expose, I guess. I hope you're starting to see how we can layer in the Jungian functions onto the Terra Minors to, to get deeper with it. So I feel like it would be really useful to have an example. So I want to take the example of the Three of Swords. This is a really interesting card to think of in this way because whenever we see the Three of Swords, we tend to think heartbreak. And yeah, there's so much heartbreak. There's so much pain in the Three of Swords, but what do we do with that? And this is where those functions can really be useful. When we pull the Three of Swords and we see heartbreak, we probably go, that's really sad and that's unfortunately the truth and I guess the tarot has validated the fact that I'm hurting right now. But we want to do something, we want to move through that space somehow. So now let's take that Three of Swords and consider how we can apply the thinking function to it. When we see the swords as representing that sense of rationality, that judgment, this is true, this is false, this is right, this is wrong. Now we have a sticking point because the swords are piercing the heart and the heart very clearly represents the wound, the heart, the emotional experience, the feeling center. Our thinking function wants to understand what is right, what is wrong. It wants to be hyper rational and really discerning and really objective. And so I'm sure you've all had the experience of after a breakup or after something really painful and heartbreaking happens, we start spiraling in our head trying to make sense of it. We're trying to figure out what did I do wrong? And so rather than sitting with the pain, really feeling it, understanding how it's reflecting on our lives, on who we are, we're trying to fix it. We're trying to rationalize our way through it. We're trying to understand how we've possibly fell into this situation and how we can avoid ever getting into it again. You're in a hyper analytical space, which is really not helpful when our hearts are broken. And so with the Three of Swords, we actually have the invitation to question, am I overthinking this right now? Do I actually just need to feel this pain? Is there really room right now to do any analysis? A lot of times when our hearts are aching and we don't have a good reason for it, our minds start to create these stories, these narratives about who we are. We rationalize things like, I am unlovable. It must be that I'm too much. It must be that I scared them away. And these stories really weigh us down and actually cause more heartache than we deserve. And so now looking at the Three of Swords in that way, it is so much richer as a point of reflection and it actually gives us an opportunity to do something. We can look at these thoughts, we can really kind of be a little critical of them and we can use that thinking function instead of wounding the heart that's already broken to create boundaries around these thoughts. There are so many different examples I could give about how layering on the Jungian functions onto the tarot is so great and so interesting and so rich, um, but I don't wanna be here <laughs> for four hours and neither do you. So I highly recommend checking out the Archetypal Tarot School, getting on the wait list if this kind of thing is really interesting to you. And I'd love to hear um, more of what you would like me to explore. So drop that in the comments. So I hope this was interesting today. I hope you go a little deeper learning about the union functions. And I'm also gonna link a video that I think is really useful for learning more about these functions. I actually, over on Instagram, I often will post about cards and how they connect to these functions. So really make sure you check that out. I think you would probably really like it. So as always, thanks for being here. Make sure you subscribe, make sure you follow me on Instagram and have a beautiful, meaningful day. Anytime I start to talk about Jung, I get a little hyper excited. So <laughs> I hope I didn't talk too fast, though I probably definitely did.